So I'm Zach. Nice to meet you all. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about contributing to Ruby. And in particular, I want you to all be able to comfortably contribute to open source by the end of this talk and understand why it's important to do this. Um, so for me, I'll tell you a little about myself. It started like two years ago. I was living in Vermont at the time, and I emailed Eric Hodel, who's a Ruby core committer, and I asked him, you know, how do I get involved with Ruby, and I want to write some documentation. And what he told me was like a bunch of stuff, basically. He was super helpful and like answered all my questions and was very patient with me and like still to this day consider him a good friend of mine. And that's sort of the beauty of like the open source community is like we're all friends. Um, and that's the true testament to that. Since being added to Ruby Core, I've talked at Ruby Kaigi in, J in Japan. Um, I talked at RubyConf last November. And I won the Ruby Prize Award in Ruby World Conference at Matsue in Tokyo. Or not Tokyo, Matsue, Japan, which is the home city of Ruby where Mats lives. Um, so that's, that's a little about me. Now I'm living in San Francisco now and flew out here just for this. And uh, my first time actually in Africa and first time in the Southern Hemisphere, to be, to be honest. <laughs> Thank you. It was a super long flight. It was like 30 hours total. <laughs> um, but it was not without its mistakes. Uh, to be honest, actually, I was supposed to fly out on Sunday, missed my flight. For some reason, I thought it'd be a good idea to, to pack my bags and drink a whole bottle of sake like an hour before my departure time. <laughs> I don't know why I made this decision, but it turns out like you need two hours to check in on Emirates, and it took me like 20 minutes on like a $60 taxi ride to get to the airport to find out that like I missed my flight. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here though, I made it. I had to rebook, I made it. And uh, so yeah, I'm here. That's me. Um, so I wanna know a little bit about you. You know me now, I told you like, my mistakes or whatever. Um, so I'm going to need all of you to stand up for a moment. So please do that. All right. So remain standing if you've ever contributed a patch to any open source project whatsoever. Good. All right, now remain standing if one of those patches happen to be in Ruby directly. <laughs> yes. Awesome. You five can leave. You are, ex <laughs> you are excused. <laughs> Thanks so much. No, literally, go. <laughs> I don't want you here. <laughs> Ah, well, yeah, that's, I'm going to talk about that. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, so round of applause for those people, too. <laughs> ah, a little nervous. All right. What's next? <laughs> See ya. Okay, so my next point is I want to change that from five people to this whole room. Now, it might sound crazy, but I honestly think everyone in here is capable of contributing to open source in one way or another. Whether or not that's directly code related, um, that's up to you. Um, there are ways without code, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, 
I thought it was really great how Charlene in her, in her talk mentioned uh, processes, how we have processes in place and methodologies and best practices. Um, so we have, we have a process in place for onboarding new contributors to Ruby. And I want to talk about that too. She also talked about the fear involved in contributing. And I really want to address this. I think it's, um, it's ho it holds a lot of people back from being great and doing what they want to do. I know, I know it's held me back in the past. And it's holding me back right now. I'm like, I don't want to be up here. <laughs> this is scary. Look at all these people. <laughs> but I'm doing it. And I know you have your doubts. Everyone does. I'm having them right now. Why am, why am I up here? Um, it's scary. It honestly is. And as I mentioned, you know, there's a few ways you can, you can contribute, but it has to be something that you want to do. And if you're still looking for a reason why, this process is a great way to um, introduce you to how open source projects work. How, um, and, and solidify your fundamentals of Ruby, because we're going to be lurk, working directly with Ruby um, and sort of dealing with the underlying implementation. In order to contribute to Ruby directly, there's a few things you need to understand. Other than like obvious language barriers, um, it moves pretty slowly. Actually, it moves more like an operating system in that we release maybe once a year. We're, we've been pretty stable up to this point because we're getting to the point where you know, we don't want to break backwards compatibility. So if we can do that in a library or something, just release it as a library. We don't really need to like, add all this new stuff to the language. Try to make like, minor improvements that can carry on. A lot of people tend to ask me, like, you know, how, do you, how do you actually commit to Ruby because of all this? And my answer is literally very carefully. It's, it's not an easy process. But there's ways you can, you can give back. You, we have a bug tracker. You can verify the existing bugs um, if you can get involved in that. Reading the mailing list is really really good way to like, just understand like, where people are at, what people are talking about. You don't necessarily need to understand everything that's going on. I know there's definitely uh, threads that I don't even read because I'm like, what? But it's, you know, do what you can and just kind of figure out where we are, where we're at, where we're going. We do have pull requests open on GitHub. So some of them get a little stagnant because not everyone reads GitHub on our team. But you can go and test those pull requests, see if they're still valid. Um, yeah, just make sure like they're still good. See if the test passed. Give any feedback you can. Do some code review with these people. Some of them are probably willing to work with you if like you just like jump in. Probably most importantly though, more than anything, and this like this kind of goes for any open source project, is like test it, run your application against it. Like before we do a release, like try the betas, try the alphas, whatever, and just like report any bugs that you run into. Now, in spite. In spite of the, the great infrastructure in place for complaining on the internet, Twitter is not a bug tracker. So I mentioned, I mentioned the fear, and I understand that like, imposter syndrome is a thing. And what I mean when I say that is people that are capable of doing something are afraid to. They're afraid to speak up. They're afraid they're going to be ridiculed. And they, just, they hold back from something that they want to do. It's, you know, it's vicious, but the only thing that's really stopping you is yourself. So in spite of this, and all the doubts you might have, and all the fear, I understand it's scary, but I want to show you a video. And I know this video inspires me, and I hope it encourages you to like chase your dreams. really important. It's important to try whatever you do. 
try your best because no, it doesn't matter how silly you're going to look. Eventually, the reward is going to pay off. You're going to get that goal. Hang on. I need to see that again. I missed it. Gorbachev. You sweet son of a bitch. <laughs> Oh God, that's me at the end of a long night. It's like, give me booze. No, don't. It's bad. So I talked about ways that you can contribute without code. And the first thing that you can do is install Ruby if you have not done that. And it may seem obvious, but how do you install Ruby, right? There's so many ways to do it. This is a common problem. We have these Ruby installer things everywhere. We have version managers, specifically the installers, like Ruby installer, Rails installer. These projects are often outdated and just like lack support from the community. I think these projects are so super important and we really need to like do anything we can to just like give back to them. A large percentage of the barrier to entry to Ruby are just like in general is these installers. Now, any existing documentation, tutorials, all that stuff, go through it again if you haven't. Um, definitely doing like workshops and stuff, you get, to, you get to see this in action. I'd recommend like going to a Rails bridge, even if you've done it before, go back, be a teacher's assistant. Um, any bugs that the students run into, try to fix, and, or just report them, and help them if you can. Now, if, if you're afraid to like report something publicly, I completely understand. And I'm willing to work with you personally, like if you send me an email, what, whatever you're running into, um, I'll work to report that anonymously and then we'll update you with whatever feedback I can get, if it's fixed, whatever. Um, so you can keep your identity anonymous. I should probably teach you how to actually report a bug. Um, that's kind of important. I think any, everyone should be able to do that. Now, like we use uh, Redmine in Ruby. Um, I'm not going to teach you Redmine. That's pretty easy. Like you can see the register button, right? You can see like where issues are. There's docs for that stuff. But the methodologies, right? What is a good bug report? Well, it's definitely not uploading like your entire application and being like, "Fix it, bro. What the hell." That's just not how it works. Like, try to get as small of a reproduction as possible. And even after you have that, like, don't just disappear on us. Like, if, if, we ask, if someone asks you, like, oh, have you tried this? Or, or maybe you should update it again and try it again because I've, I've released some fix. Like, actually do it and give them feedback if possible. And if it has been resolved or you fix it yourself, like, update the ticket. Be like, yeah, this is what I did to so the next person that comes along. Like, this is like 101 stuff, right? But it's important to like rem rem remember this when you're, t when you're teaching new people, even if you've already known. So, I mean, those are some general guidelines that are good to follow. When we talk about like documentation and how we can contribute that to Ruby, we have, we have the Documenting Ruby site, which is a project organized by committers um, in order to help new contributors submit documentation to Ruby and improve it patch by patch. Every patch counts, no matter how small. And you don't have to be, like, in order to write documentation, you really don't have to be, like, a Ruby expert or a C expert. All you really have to have is, like, the desire to do this, right? And some intuition to be able to follow feedback do some homework on your own. The next, the next thing I want to share with you is um, a success story that we had in this project. And I worked one-on-one -on -one with a contributor for the RSS library. Um, you don't need to know what RSS is if you don't know what that is. All you need to know is that it's a library that's maintained and released with Ruby. So they reached out to me 
And I just want to use this as an example to show you like how how much we're willing to like strive to be accessible and make this as easy as possible for people. So he sent me this ticket. You know, I'm planning to do some work. I was like, okay. Sounds good, bro. Send me an email. And he did. He sent me an email, and you might not be able to read all that, but there's a link. So we click links when we get them, right? And what I got was a patch from him, and I was looking at it. It was like 111 editions. Okay, that's going to take me about an hour or two to review, depending on like the complexity of the patch um, and definitely like what it involves. Documentation, you're like, oh, that's easy. 100 lines, boom, done. Well, it's a little harder than that. Ended up turning into 17 comments um, that I added to his, co to his commit and trying to provide him as much feedback as possible. <clears throat> this is a good example. So we have this method, have XML content, and it does some, does some things. So what this is is a predicate method, and it's designed to um, determine like true or false depending on the expression. Oh, I made this comment, but literally when I reread this, I went back to it. I was like, that doesn't make sense at all. Like, XML is not XHTML. What? <laughs> I don't even know how this method works. But it's small enough of a comment that it's like, okay, just try to hide the details. Because really who's reading this is like users, and they don't care like about the specifics. This is a pretty obvious example. Um, in this, we have the module person construct. And just in the, in the, in the document that he sent me, um, he had separated them into other words. And generally, what we want to do is use the same constant name so that we can reference them later in documentation. I tried to give him some constructive feedback. I think I asked, yeah, I asked him for some examples, like, how have you used this? How could this be used? You know, try to lead him further into um, trying to understand this thing. Even if like, our users don't care, this individual cares or is trying to learn something, so let's help them. So, so in this example, we have the date construct, which does some like, formatting of dates in some kind of standardized looking thing. Um, what I did was I found what that format was that he was trying to, trying to find or what he was thinking of. And just gave him a little pointer, like, maybe he'll go look into it. Our users might care what this kind of format is. We can tell them about it. We don't need to like, document the whole spec, but we can definitely like, point them in the right direction to learn more. Um, this is a good example of how translations and language barriers can suck. So in his original patch, he said like, some crazy stuff that I can't even make sense of. And definitely a non-native English speaker, which is a pretty good percentage of the world, is not going to understand. So I try to like, make it as concise as possible and just give him like, an example of what that might look like. Be aware of this especially when reporting to Ruby Core because most of the team are, is in Japan and they don't even speak in Engl English as their first language. Um, they can read it pretty well, but just think about that before you send like a thousand word like white paper of like your bug because they're gonna have to translate that whole thing. This is, a, this is another good one. I like the sentence that's like any nor empty or something something like, as a non-native English speaker, that's going to be hard to parse, right? So just try to make it as simple as possible. It's so confusing. This is, this is an interesting one because he sent me a patch that says, oh, look at the args that are passed into this method. But when you actually look at the method, there's no args in the parameters, bro. That's a bug. You just sent me a bug. <laughs> but we fixed it, and with this code review process, I was able to like, catch it and, and fix it before it was released, um, before anyone ran into it. So this process definitely helps um, 
both, both ends of the spectrum. The end result here is I committed his patch. He, made, he adjusted after my, su my suggestions, and he got his first commit into Ruby, which is really good for him. And I know he worked hard on it, and that's good. And now he's officially like forever ingrained in the, in, in the history of Ruby. Right? And what I mean by that is this one commit is literally one of six people who have committed a patch to RSS in the seven years since it was written. And it's kind of crazy. Seven years is a long time in computers. He was really appreciative. He sent me an email like thanking me, made my day. I really love getting emails like this, so please send me lots of great emails like thanking me for stuff. <laughs> Even if I didn't do it, just I'll take credit. And that's pretty much it. I, I'm not going to take questions because I end up getting a lot of the same questions. And so what I did was compile a little list of them. And I have like fake answers. They might be real. <laughs> First question, do we have any guidelines? How do, how do I find out how to report a bug? Like, we actually have a contributing doc in the Ruby source code that tells you, like, what a good feature looks like, what a proposal, how you can make a proposal to, like, improve Ruby in the language or add, add features. We have all that stuff in, a, in, a, in one file. Do I need to know C? I kind of said this, but no, you don't. I barely know C, and I've already had like almost 500 patches in the Ruby. It's not a requirement. Yeah, if you want to like optimize the garbage collector, you need to know C. You probably need to know way more than C. <laughs> How do you work with such a huge code base? It's a good one. I uh, I don't actually. No. Um, Ruby source code is actually super organized. There's native extensions, there's a standard library, there's tests. They're all in like their own directories and sorted by library, et cetera. There's like all the core classes and stuff. Um, but definitely grep and exuberant C tags are super helpful. How many patches does it take to become a committer? Um, so no actual requirement. All you really need to do is like impress a committer and one day they'll be like, please commit this, and they'll have vouched for you, and then you get commit. Matt will send you an email and be like, send me your keys, bro. And you'll be like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was the best day of my life. <laughs> Eric, Eric was the one that vouched for me, and since I was added, I've added two more committers to the team. One of them, which has actually never committed a patch to Ruby before being added. Um, they were just the right fit, and we, we wanted them to help us out with something, so we added them. I kind of talked about this. Are smaller patches preferred? Um, yeah, totally. We're mostly a volunteer team. There's maybe four actual paid committers on the team, and the rest of us are very constricted on time, so if you send us a small patch that's like atomic, like this one thing, fix this one thing in a few lines, like. It's going to make it easier to review. It's going to make it easier to commit without having to like worry about any regressions that may take place. And the last question that I love to get is, can I submit patches via GitHub? And absolutely. We have pull requests on for a reason. Some of the committers actually use GitHub because we have Travis CI linked up, and it'll run our tests. I do this all the time. I'm super lazy. I'll just like push, a, push to a topic branch on GitHub and like let Travis deal with it, because I just don't care. If it fails, then commit it, whatever. Let someone else deal with it. <laughs> it's, a it's a pretty good strategy. And I just bump up my commits that way. Just make new bugs, fix them. <laughs> no, that's, that's pretty much it. If you do have questions, and I definitely want to help all of you and hear from all of you how, how you might be able to help Ruby. Um, my email is on my GitHub account. That's my Twitter. You can send me a tweet, or you can find me after this talk. Um, and let's just work together and make Ruby as awesome as we can. Thank you.
<laughs> oh, one other thing. Sorry, I just remembered. Yeah, so on, as Andre mentioned, um, RubyGems and Bundler are both need help. So the good thing is RubyGems is, is a part of Ruby. And so it still is like under the same sort of process. We can help you get involved in that project. Does need help. I'm also a member of Bundler Core, and I can help you with that as well. Um, those two projects definitely need help. Um, they're priority because everyone uses them and relies on them. So definitely see myself or Andre and help us with those as well. So thank you.